and welcome to Literary Hype. I am Stephanie, your Literary Hype Woman, and I am crossing something off my bucket list with today's video, and I am so excited about it. So excited! About 10 years ago or so, we were all very into this young adult dystopian series called Divergent. Well, today, I get to share a conversation with you with the one and only Veronica Rock, who wrote this wonderful trilogy that was very controversial in the end, but we enjoyed it while it lasted. Um, Veronica's also got two books coming out in the next couple months. One of them is Poster Girl, and one of them is Arch Conspirators. So this was her first time talking about both of these upcoming books, and I'm very excited to share this interview with you with Veronica Rock. We're here at C2E2 in Chicago, which is why I am in costume. I am Sylvie from Loki, I'm here with Veronica Roth. If you were dressing up for a convention, who would you be? Okay, so I the only thing I've ever cosplayed as successfully before was Draco Malfoy because I had short blonde hair and, of course, you know, various accoutrements. Um, I don't think I would dress as him anymore. So now I have to figure out who I could look like. So, I don't know, maybe something from Zelda? really like Breath of the Wild, so I don't know, maybe. There's just so many opportunities. There's such a variety of costumes here. Have you ever seen anybody cosplay as somebody from one of your books? Yeah, there's a lot of Triss Priors in my past, because um, really it's a pretty easy costume. You know, it's just like the all black and then like the little birds at the collarbone or whatever. So I've seen a lot of those. Um, and I think someone was Syrah from Carve the Mark once, which was pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and speaking of looks, so you've got Poster Girl coming out here very soon. I think that the girl on the cover of Poster Girl looks like you. Was that intentional? No, it's not. Um, I, I was like, I don't see it. And then i like, now I, I can see it, I guess. She sort of looks like generic woman, though. Like, white, white woman. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe it, does she really look like me or does she look like women? <laughs> it could go either way. I just like the eyes. I was like... It, did they try to make this look like Veronica? Well, I, maybe I should dress as her then and just outline one of my eyes in dark eye makeup because that's what's on the cover. I don't know. Maybe one day. Yeah. Okay. So, Poster Girl's coming out soon. Give us a little background on what this story is. Yeah. So, Poster Girl's a dystopian mystery. Um, it's about a woman who, uh, after the kind of collapse of a dystopian regime, she... Uh, is imprisoned along with everyone else who is favored by that regime and she gets an opportunity 10 years later to earn her freedom and she just has to find this girl who was taken from her family by the old old regime and placed with a new one and no one can find her. So it's just about um, her kind of navigating her indoctrination a little bit, like unraveling that over the course of the story and then also um, on a search for this missing girl which turns out to be far more complicated than she orig originally was aware of. So yeah. It absolutely does, and it is so intense. I think it's your best book yet. It's my favorite. What was kind of the inspiration for this story? Um, I think it kind of came together when I realized I wanted to write about someone who is guilty instead of someone who's a hero or who's innocent. That was a new challenge for me, trying to get that character, make them interesting and compelling without kind of like brushing over what's in their past. Um, and. So I think that was the, the challenge that kind of set me up for the book. And then, of course, there's just a lot of other things I was thinking about, like how to kind of unravel your own complicity in, in harmful systems, but then also like how to deal with maybe like what your family has done in the past. Um, and the insight is like this piece of tech that's in the book. It's an ocular implant that tracks your behavior. And I just thought, like, while I was wrestling with how to relate to social media when we were all kind of, like, locked inside <laughs> for the pandemic, I had this on my mind a lot, like, how it influences our behavior and all that stuff. So that's all in the book. Yeah. Yeah, so the insight, so my first thought when I read about what the insight looked like is uh, Host by Stephanie Meyer, because there's, like, the alien with the silver ring. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, silver rings in the eye are, like, such a great sci-fi image. Um, if you look on Pinterest, which I did, of course, there's, like, a million of them. But, yes. Yeah, it's so it's a piece of technology that's, like, injected into the eyeball as when you're a kid, and then it uses the minerals in your body to, like, build a new body for itself. So it looks like a jellyfish. Yeah. It's gross. <laughs> It sounded gross in the description. I was like, Ew, no, no, no. In your brain. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, 
so creating kind of technology, there's a lot of technology in this book that does not exist. How do you go about cre coming up with these ideas and the names for them? Well, I think we kind of have this technology already, except we've attached it to our hands instead of injecting it into our eyeballs. So it's just like one step away from the smartphone, really, because that the smartphone is tracking your behavior. People can access like how you use your data, which of course I think we're all aware of now with people becoming like more alarmed about their menstruation tracking apps, you know, um, for good reason. Like that data, it goes into this, you know, into the cloud or whatever, and then people can buy it. I sound like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat right now. Um, <laughs> but it is like a part of our reality that I think people don't want to think about or don't think about in general. So um, for me, it was like, well, this already exists. So uh, we just have to think of like, as far as like how you name it, I just thought of, you know, what would we name a d device like this? Like, make it sound so beautiful, like an insight. Like, oh, mm. how lovely. <laughs> I thought insight was very clever, too, because it's insight and it's giving you insight into things. So very smart on your part. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot of other products that you came up with the names for and all these concepts. Where did those ideas come from? Um, sometimes I would look at, like, the history behind product names that we have now, like, where do those come from? But I really like digging into, I think there's, like, a company called Abraxas in, in there, and, um, I don't know, I looked into, like, mythology and, uh, and history and all those things to kind of build, I don't know. We draw from the past and we name things a lot, so I figured in the future we would do that too. So, I don't know, it's sort of random how I name things sometimes. <laughs> Did you do a lot of research in like psychology into to helping figuring out how she Sonia would kind of go through her process of figuring out what really happened with her? Yeah, so I, I looked a lot into the psychological effects of surveillance. That was kind of the bulk of my research. And what I discovered is that people uh, don't react the same way, like the way they react to being surveilled depends on how they feel about the one surveilling them. So like if your parent is watching you sleep, you don't feel like it's creepy. But if it's someone who's antagonistic toward you watching you sleep, that's very different. So the psychological impact changes too. Um, and that was, that was really interesting to read about. So that's like the shift in her mentality throughout the course of the story. She's not alarmed at being watched in the beginning and then as the story goes on she starts to understand that like the person watching her was not uh was not friendly to her so that's how she starts to unravel everything with poster girl she that's set in seattle vancouver portland area when a lot of your other books have been set in chicago right what made you change your location <sighs> so honestly it's because it, it was in the middle of lockdown so I w couldn't travel, or I didn't want to travel, and I feel like you can't set that many books in Chicago. And I needed, because of the way the story works, and you'll know what I'm talking about, but um, I needed a city that was bordered by a national forest. So there's really only so many of those that I've been to and have experienced from afar, because I couldn't go visit to like research. So I had to just rely on my memory of the place. And I've been to Seattle more than I've been to most cities, or most other cities. So that's kind of why. Yeah. So kind of convenient also. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the like particular character of Seattle, Portland area. Like it has to do with, you know, the needs of the story. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying like Seattle is more prone to this dystopia than other places. I'm not. <laughs> How do you ever sleep? Because you have a second book coming out yeah. in like not even six months after. It's a novella. Yeah, so it's shorter. But yes, Arch Conspirator is a sci-fi retelling of Antigone that comes out in February. So I, I've always loved Antigone. Um, I think feminist retellings of, of Greek mythology, Greek mythology or tragedy or whatever are, are a thing, you know, but uh, Antigone is like already feminist, is my argument for Antigone. She is like a fully realized, complex character, and that it was written so long ago is what's really compelling to me. She is like one of the more comp complex women I've ever seen in literature, and she's like from this old Greek tragedy. So um, that's one of the reasons that I gravitated toward her. And as far as figuring out how to do a sci-fi retelling, I just kind of thought about the situation um, that the audience of Antigone was in when they were seeing this play performed. and. Uh, tried to make decisions to make it futuristic that would give it the same impact for like us when we're reading it now. So um, that was my approach. It was difficult. <laughs> I had to read a lot of different versions of Antigone and a lot of scholarship about it. But um, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy with it. So. 
And like Greek mythology retellings are so on trend right now. What made you want to join in on all of that? Well, no mythology, thankfully. I don't know if I could tackle that. But it wasn't so much about joining anything in particular as I just, um, I was talking to a friend and I said like, oh, I would never do a retelling. And she was like, oh yeah, yeah, that would be, you know, really like a big challenge. And I was like, except maybe like Antigone. I would maybe retell Antigone. And she was like, well, now you have to do it. So that's, that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. So your panel here was on world building. Uh, what kind of process do you go through to build the worlds in your novels? Basically, I don't have a whole lot of patience for details, um, which I know sounds like an odd thing for a sci-fi fantasy writer who is trying to write detailed worlds. But what that means is that I rely a lot on drafts. So I do a lot of revision. Um, everything I write is kind of at first a little bit bare bones, and then I add layers of of you know world building and character backstory and complexity as I go um, and I've kind of just learned that's how I have to do things it's very inefficient because you have to then like every time you add something you have to go and examine the way that it impacts the rest of the story and the plot sometimes you end up rewriting huge sections so um, yeah I rewrite a lot a lot Divergent was such a big hit did you feel a lot of pressure do you still feel a lot of pressure coming off of that with every other release that you do um, yeah, I mean, I think it's impossible to avoid that feeling, but I just, I mean, it's been now, you know, 10 years since the first book came out, so I just have to, like, grow and change as a writer, so I have to allow myself to do that. So I try not to hold myself to what came before and just try and work with what I have now and the ideas that I have now and make them the best I can. So I just try and, like, not think about it, basically, is what I'm telling you. Try to be present. What's the best writing advice that you've ever got? Oh man, um, I, I feel like the writing advice that sticks with me the most is really practical. So like I had a professor tell me once like, don't bring anything new into your ending. Look in the beginning and the middle for what you've already set up and then like find an ending there. So that was a really good piece of advice. Um, and also like only put as much in your backpack as you need to climb to the top of the mountain, which means like get rid of the excess in your story. You know, that was a good piece of advice. Um, yeah, I think those are my top two that I think about the most. And since this is literary hype, what books are you hyped about the most right now? Oh my god, um, I'm really hyped about I'm the Girl by Courtney Summers, which comes out soon, I think, in a couple weeks, mid-September. Um, that's a contemporary YA. Uh, it's inspired by the Jeffrey Epstein case, and it is disturbing, but really powerful and meaningful too. And then what else? Um, the Women Could Fly by Megan Giddings comes out, I think, next month. And it is like a... It's a fantasy, women are witches, but it's, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm pretty hyped about that one, too. And I think Nona the Ninth comes out, like, imminently. So, pour it into my brain, please. Yep. <laughs> Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, that's all. <laughs> well, thanks so much for sharing your time with us here at CTV2. Yeah, thank you for having me. I should note I did ask if Veronica wanted me to be more normal looking for the interview and she told me to commit to the moment so that is the fun quirky energy that I love hanging out with and Veronica was so much fun to talk to we had a blast as I think you can probably tell from that interview we were having a good old time at C2E2 uh, Poster Girl is scheduled to come out in October Arch Conspirator is scheduled to come out in February so go ahead and link check out those links in the, in the comments below to get your pre-orders in and in the meantime while you're waiting on those books don't get to read. Read up on Divergent, Car for the Mark, Chosen Ones. She's got so many good books out there. Poster Girl is currently my favorite of hers. Uh, please give this video a like if you enjoyed this interview and subscribe to the channel. We got a lot more fun stuff on the way for you. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.